You know what I like doing? I really like doing with these videos. I like to go back in time when I started this whole thing and say, hello everyone and welcome to another edition of what's on my desk. Of course, it's not really my desk. It's, we're in the studio and I'm not really alone. I have the pleasure of having Marco with me. Today's topic is going to be the Holy Trinity. I mean, it's a topic that's been mulled over so many times. Of course, we're going to give you a different take on that. And that's everything you guys wanna know. And that is market. What's going on in the market? Uh, what's going on specifically with a Holy Trinity? Because if you look across the three brands, i.e. Paddock, Vacheron, and Audemars Piguet, you'll notice that some of the biggest hits on some models across those three brands were specifically in the Holy Trinity. Yeah. Because we were living finally in a world where the Holy Trinity was truly a Holy Trinity because for a while there, Vacheron was lagging when it comes to sale, when it comes to popularity, when it comes to models selling over lists, etc., etc. The reason you're not seeing any watches or briefcases underneath is because unfortunately all that stuff is nicely packed up, picked up by two armed guards on its way to Miami where we're going to be at the Miami Antique Show. The Holy Trinity, as it's dubbed, there was really no official announcement we don't really know where that kind of came from, do we? I mean, I know yeah. there's a few theories. Why, in your opinion, is APBC and PP <laughs> the Holy Trinity? Yeah, well, first of all, as a fan of, obviously, What's On My Desk, having watched it you know, for so many years, it's a pleasure to be a part of one <laughs> now, finally. It's a pretty, pretty big step. Um, yeah, so in terms of the Holy Trinity itself, well, the Holy Trinity really started, I would say, more so as an enthusiast kind of ideal, if you will, right? It was the, the enthusiast that said, okay, what are the, the pinnacle of Swiss, specifically Swiss watchmaking? Because, you know, like for example, Breguet started out, it, it, it's right up there in my opinion in the conversation, but you know, it started out as a French brand. Long and Zone obviously has the merits to be in the Trinity, but they're German. But when we talk about the Holy Trinity, we're talking about the best the Swiss have to offer. And, you know, it, it's, you'd be hard pressed to find three more important brands in the history of watchmaking than those three, right? Starting with Patek Philippe, you know, one of the most historic, we like to call them the king of complications. The Rolls Royce of all watch brands. Exactly, right. I mean, in terms of innovation, in terms of, you know, they're the first to kind of serially produce perpetual calendar chronographs, went on to create, you know, so many different things, annual calendars and wristwatches. They started the perpetual calendars. Actually, they were the first to feature a world time in a wristwatch, although VC did it first in a pocket watch with the Louis Cotier system. I think it really goes back to that history with Patek Philippe, but also in terms of the watchmaking. The watchmaking is just is stellar. When it comes to AP, the, the watchmaking always was stellar. I think it's very neglected today, especially if you go back to their, their founding, right? Because we've said this time and time again, the AP brand started with their two founders making complicated movements for Tiffany & Co. And that's how they really gained notoriety. And AP, in my opinion, is super underrated for their watchmaking today just because they have the, what Adrian, I think so aptly called the greatest blank canvas in the history of watchmaking in the Royal Oak, right? You see so many Royal Oaks nowadays that you tend to neglect the fact that there's so many great designs, so many great, incredible- the Equation of time. Uh, yeah, split, absolutely. Split second chronograph, perpetual calendars, the grand complication, minute repeater, split second perpetual calendars. Yeah, the concept line. The, the concept line. I mean, it just goes uh, the wandering, on on. The wandering hours, you know, yeah. uh, it's, it, there's, there's so many things that AP has done, but it's very difficult to continue shining in that old traditional, specifically watchmaking or horology, when the minute you mention the word AP or Audemars Piguet, the first thing people think of is a Royal Oak, yeah. right? Yeah, 100%. I, I think that's the, the, the main takeaway, at least from the modern AP brand, is that people tend to neglect or forget about how good of a watchmaker they are and how innovative they are as well, right? Because that, that, that can be understated and it shows that they're not unwilling to push their boundaries and want to continue to innovate just by the fact that they now bought Renault and Poppy, right? Renault and Poppy being probably the greatest. I mean, it's the house. Yeah, it, it. It's, it's, there's, I don't know. Apart I can't from it. JLC, I don't think that there has been a more innovative like like think tank for movement making in the last, I would say, 100 Let's years. Let's take like, names that came out of there. Yeah, I mean, we're talking about, so first of all, Robert Grubel, Stephen Forsey, you're wearing a really nice Grubel Forsey on wrist as we speak. So that's those are two names that come out of there. But there's so many others that are forgotten about. Tim and Bart Gronfeld, the Gronfeld brothers. William de Haas, who now works at Elon the end zone. Uh, Karel Forestier, who worked on the Cartier Monopusher and is pretty much responsible for a lot of the modern uh, Cartier Collection Privé line. Another amazing independent watchmaker, Andrea Streller. When you go back to their, the, the foundations of AP, or RP rather, Renault and Poppy, 
you see all the best independent watchmakers of this generation essentially come out from there. The only one that I think wasn't there was FP Jorn, pretty much. <laughs> like that, You're right. That, that's pretty much he it. He must have missed the bus that day or something. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean he came a little bit beforehand, but he he you know he he's kind of in, in his own league at this point uh, in terms of the minds of most collectors. But when you think about innovation, AP is really at the forefront of watchmaking innovation. They just tend to use the Royal Oak case because I'll it looks so good. Give you a hot so take good. on that. Uh, I'm going to say, I'm going to use the word timing, yeah. right? Consider the world we live in today and the type of exposure a watchmaker, a watch company, even a watch group can get with the power of social media, with the power of uh, so many different types of social media now, with the fact that the space out in the social media world when it comes to watches has probably grown, I'm going to go out on a limb and say 50x or 100x in the last five years alone, right? Where you have little kids running around saying, oh, that's a Rolex Amara, right? Uh, it's just so much more visible. If you think back to innovation, right, from uh, AP, let's specifically talk about material innovation, right? Oh, yes. This is around the time that I started. When I started, there was no Facebook or Instagram or YouTube, and nor was there what's on my desk. This is what's on my desk 2.0, by the way. 2.0. New right. and improved with younger people. <laughs> uh, with that said, uh, Let's go back, starting with things like the alacrite. I'm just strictly talking materials. Yeah. Use of alacrite. Then moving on to the use of carbon. Then moving on to the use of ceramic. Uh, yeah. sim things as simple as the rubber strap or caoutchouc, as they call them, right? Yeah. Uh, from Audemars Piguet. You have all these material innovations that were not in the spotlight as much as, let's say, uh, Richard Mule using TPT, right? Yeah. And Everybody jumped on a bad wing and everybody started making carbon watches, ceramic watches, and, and things of that nature. I will give the crystal case to Richard Mille, right? Yeah. But at the time where Audemars Piguet was doing this, all this innovation, uh, there was not as much spotlight. So people tend to give credit to some of the newer comers or, or uh, when it comes to like Richard Mille, because at the time that stuff was starting to get innovated, not horologic, not horologic specifically, it wasn't a spotlight. At the same token, Horological innovation, same thing. Think of the independence today and some of the stuff they put out and how much, for lack of a better word, as I say, how much clout they get today because of social media that's out there. I'm not yeah. talking about guys like us that you know, sell watches for a living. I'm talking about enthusiasts. I'm talking about guys that are just simply bloggers or bloggers about watches. I think timing is also extremely important because some of the innovations that they did 20 years ago, 15 years ago today are given, like ceramic like carbon, like rubber, and all those things that all of a sudden they become kind of like a big deal but sort of like a given. And I think that was another, um, I don't want to call it a downside, but that was another unfair um, you know, thing that happened to AP in terms of timing. Sort of, I can't call them ahead of their time, I can't call them ahead of their time, but they were ahead of the time of social media and I think that was another drawback. Actually, I completely agree with you. I would even take it a step further. I think Richard Mill even took a page out of AP, AP's book Specifically, you take a look at, for example, in the early 2000s, what they were doing, for example, with ambassadors. Arnold, for example, they had a ton of ambassadors, but Arnold comes to mind more specifically. 28 different watches from Exactly. Arnold. So, so that's, that's their use of ambassadors. They understood that that was their social media back in the day. You see Richard Mill doing that exact same thing, but they don't go for the low-hanging fruit. You know, they, they really go for ambassadors that they know have this global appeal, have, you know, they stick to Formula One, for example. They stick to, they stick to things that will appeal to the mass market in a way that also appeals to a demographic that are, you know, for no, lack they're of a smart. Better, they're using they're using they're spending. using things like tennis. Correct. Expensive sports. Correct. Tennis, F one. Yeah. But at the same token, you gotta take your hat off to Richard Meal and, and you know, there's still a lot of ambassadors that you probably wouldn't know who they are. No, 100%. I.e. the guy that Pharrell, dives really example. fast, like, to the other side of the earth. Uh, I mean, even Pharrell. Pharrell is another one in the music industry. Pharrell, no, Pharrell is a very visible figure. But but, but when, he's very visible. I mean, even, for example, the Sapphire cases they did with Jay-Z, the Sapphire case, RM56s. So, so they, they have taken a page out of AP's book. I think AP was really the first to realize, okay, social media wasn't around at the time, but ambassadors are where we can get those eyes. Because what do people want? They want what what they can't have and or what others have in terms of you know celebrities you see the biggest of people course. in the world wearing a watch of course i want to own that watch here's another another hot take for you going back to exactly what i said and again timing was not the best for Artemar Piguet because if they at the time richard meal started bringing on these ambassadors now 
they have ambassadors that have gajillions of followers on Instagram, yeah. gajillions of followers on Twitter, whatever, whatever, where back then they didn't have all that. But yet somehow they still managed to survive and to go back to the original topic, it's, they're still part of that holy trinity and they were still one of the three brands that had the hottest selling pieces on the market. No doubt. I will put, I'm not putting Rolex into this mix and it's very difficult to do so. I always put Rolex aside because I feel like in terms of sales and popularity, Rolex is so far out from number two, three, They're or four. in a league of their own. They're in a league of their own. But, but the thing is that differentiates, kind of going back on topic, that differentiates the holy trinity, right? Is each one brings something to watchmaking in terms of like high caliber movements. When you think of Rolex- Horology. Exactly, exactly. So, so they bring something to the world of horology that has either never been done, never been seen before in the fashion in which that they do it. So you look at someone like Vacheron Constantin, for example. Your favorite brand, we gotta talk about that. <laughs> yeah, so I do love Vacheron a lot. I, I think in terms of serial produced watches, they make some of the nicest watches in the world. And the reason I like Vacheron is because they're not just strictly a movement company, even though they are you know, very technically innovative. What I think differentiates Vacheron from AP and Patek is they're very artistic. You look at the forms of their cases, the way that they make their lugs, for example. There's that artistic expression that I feel is very lost. It's a lost art when you think about dial making and case making. You go back to the 1940s, which you know, in the, in the history of horology is kind of the spinning distance. It's really not that far. These were all watches that were put together in terms of case, dial, uh, movement from the highest level artisans. And now that's kind of lost in serial production because you know things are kind of made to scale in mass, but you still see that kind of artistic conception with VC that I think can be lost sometimes with Patek and, VC, uh, and AP specifically. Well, you want to talk about uh, artistic, let's talk about Meteor Arts, uh, you know, the mask set. Uh, let's talk about uh, the various enamel dial pieces that have made. Uh, let's talk about the jewelry lines that Vacheron has, right? Yeah. I think when it comes to jewelry lines, I mean, AP is there with me. I've seen some tremendous jewelry pieces from yeah. uh, AP. No doubt. But if I look at Paddock and if I look at AP and I look at Vacheron and you ask me, give me the one brand where there's an iconic jewelry piece. Jewelry pieces are always overlooked. They're the ones that usually don't hold the value as well. They're the ones that don't deem to be iconic pieces. Often they're deemed to be gaudy, and AP has made some pretty gaudy stuff. But there is one watch from Vacheron that people will recognize by name and call it an iconic watch, and that's the VC Kala. You have the King Kala, you have the Lord Kala, you have the, there's another Kala which is a little bit smaller, different sizes. Again, it's the use of baguette diamonds and what basically looks like a big diamond bracelet, right? But that's a watch that's iconic, a watch that was owned by Michael Jackson. Uh, a few, along with a few other pretty big time celebrities, you know, royalties and things of that nature. AP and, and Paddock don't really have that. They don't really have that iconic, you know, gem set time yeah. piece. I think the way that they, they are iconic is different from the likes of a VC, right? VC has, again, has come a long way in recent years, but you know, you look back in recent memory, even five, five, six years ago, they were extremely overlooked. And that's part of the reason why I, I really like them because I felt they were just such a good brand and so overlooked for a long time. And again, so the longest ru continuously running company. Yeah, like, in, longest in the continuous industry. running since 1755. So yeah. the history is there, the pedigree is there. And, and that's what really comprises the Holy Trinity. When you think Patek Philippe, AP and VC, they each bring a different flavor to the equation, if you will something that is different, that has never been done before, and they always consistently push the boundaries with respect to what has been done. And that's always nice to see, especially because they are kind of the standard bearers of Swiss horology, which is Sky Moon Terbium from Patek Philippe, or the Vashon, what's that can't pronounce that name, they're grand, they're, they're Sky Yeah, the, like, oof. I mean, the, the, the well, thing is... How do you is, even pronounce that name? I, I think it's Le Cabonetier is, is yeah, the name. Oh, thank that's you. The, that's the one you're talking about. I said somebody speaks French. <laughs> so the, the thing is, is the Patek Sky Moon Turbion is so iconic. And even though I love the, the brand as, as a whole VC, I would still pick the Sky Moon Turbion because that's just a, in a league of its own in terms of... But you're also talking about much lower production numbers on Vacheron side versus yeah, Sky Moon Turbion. Yeah, 100%. But... I think what is... Watch, watch for watch, I think, I think Patek fully especially at the highest end of watchmaking, there's really few brands that I think are com as competitive. The only one I can think of that really is in competition with Patek Philippe is Longa. 
in terms of watchmaking. Watchmaking for watchmaking. I'm waiting on Langa to still produce. I mean, look, they made the turbiliograph, right? Uh, I'm still wa waiting for Langa to come out and show, oh, here's our Skyman turbine. Yeah, I yeah. mean, they got, but they have so much, right? They have the double splits, triple splits. I mean, they have uh, your the, pro perpetual. the problem. The problem is this, is that <clears throat> when, again, arguably the most underrated uh, complication in a watch. Most people don't look at a chronograph, oh my God, that's such a complicated watch. Yeah. Well, we talked about this numerous times, chronograph is an extremely, extremely hard complication to execute properly, right? Extreme. The loss of amplitude in a watch when you start setting off a stopwatch, literally inside a watch, is a big to-do, and to keep up with that and to execute it properly is not that easy. But because you have a chronograph present and from any fashion watch that's out there for four or five hundred dollars all the way out to the most complicated pieces, people tend to overlook it, right, as not a big deal. So when Langa did the double split, and again, this is where they split the seconds and the minutes, and then follow up with a triple split where you can literally split the second, the minutes, and the hours. How useful? Maybe not so much in today's day and age, but how complicated? Oh my God. But yet, people still overlook the double split and the triple split much like they overlooked the 31 day power reserve watch. Yeah, right? that's another. Yeah. Which is another humongous feat to have a watch that has with a 31 day power reserve to keep accurate time for that long, a month. It's a lot. Yeah, the only other ones I could think of is like Hublot Key of Time. I think Jacob. But that was, a, but yeah. Hublot Key of Time was not developed by Hublot. It was created, developed by the company starts with B I, something. I don't know if it's the Key of Time, but there's one Hublot watch that has like a 51 day power reserve or something like insane like that. You need like a drill to wind it. That, uh, that's the LaFerrari you're talking about? LaFerrari, the LaFerrari. La Ferrari. That's yeah, the that one. That was yeah. a feat. That was so, a, so the LaFerrari, there's a Jacob watch that has also like a huge power reserve. But again, when you think of watchmaking pedigree, you know, the Hublot and, and Jacob and Co. are not thought of on the the same realm as, as long as I always people always ask me that when I, I, I remember I was talking about the key of time you brought up and I was talking about we had the a piece unique LaFerrari crystal turbine if you remember that and it, that watch sold within six days of us receiving it uh, and people are like oh my god Hublot I'm like guys I said first and foremost there's Hublot and then there's Hublot right when you start looking at the upper echelon in terms of horology across any brand first look into who developed the movement who made the movement uh, Hublot ended up buying a company uh, in, it wasn't ever known by P, but in the likes of yeah. uh, when they saw what they were innovating in terms of the key of time. Yeah. But we're, well, we're getting off topic. So on a, a longer uh, double split, and triple, what Longa hasn't done is that one watch was just a lot of complications, right? Because uh, what makes the Sky Moon Turbion so unique, right, is the fact that in one watch, you end up with a full-blown perpetual calendar, you end up with a sky chart, you end up with a minute repeater, right? So it's multiple complications. Not to mention some of them have engraved cases and like... It just, just, just strictly yeah. in terms of complications. One of the most impressive watches that I ever had the chance to handle was the Gerald Genta Grand Complications. It was actually one made for the Sultan of Brunei. You know, the guy that like spent $60 billion, that guy. <laughs> uh, and uh, I had his, his a Grand Petit Sonnery full-blown perpetual calendar minute repeater turbion. That was probably one of the most, oh my God, watches I've held in my hand. You know, with that whole step case, I had like five steps, if you know, and yeah. the typical Gerald Genta design, it wasn't too big in diameters, which is really, it was really thick because you needed to fit all that stuff in there, but it wasn't too large, surprisingly. So we need Longa, I feel like, to do that. Just put, you know, make a grand complication. Maybe just do what AP has done. Uh, minute repeater, split second, chronograph, yeah. perpetual calendar, automatic, something like that. But to go back to the Holy Trinity and why we started this whole conversation, because again, it's, it's really about market. If we glance back at the market over the last couple of years, and even go back a little bit further, it stands true that, you know, uh, Paddock went through the popularity of their sports steel models twice, all the way up to uh, the crisis in 08, and then everything kind of crashed and people forgot about them, certainly forgot about Aquanauts. Uh, Nautilus is not so much, but again, there wasn't that crazy. They were trading a double list back then. They came back down to slightly under list. The Aquanauts were, were not part of that equation because back then they were still small. We we're talking about 50, 65 yeah, and things of that nature, sports, right? Yeah. It wasn't as of late till they came out with the 51, uh, 67s and things like that. When they got bigger, more wearable, added complication. Integrated rubber strap. Exactly. It's a nicer look. Exactly. Yeah. Nicer look. They still did a shit job on a bracelet, by the way, even today. Yeah, the but bracelet With that said, <clears throat> You know, and then the pickup of the Nautilus line, I actually remember, I remember this thing going, they were on the market for like $25,000, $26,000, $27,000, $28,000, you know, back, from, back down from like 65 at their highest before 08. And all of a sudden, I, I started seeing demand, people calling me dealers, hey, do you have a Nautilus, you have a Chrono, you have a Nautilus? And then I realized, 
they were getting bust down. So people, 47th Street, along others, they started to diamond them out and sell them, you know, at a very good margin. That was the first thing that actually made him go up, believe it or not. Yeah, because supply obviously supply supply was longer. still yeah. short. Uh, when you're talking about Royal Oak and you talk about Royal Oak offshore pre-08, it was the era of the offshore. Yeah. Right. And Royal Oaks was just like, eh, whatever, because they were small. But it was also an era where bigger was better. That was the time where it's like a oh, bigger, 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 bigger. Let's make a 60 millimeter Panerai, right? Uh, and so Royal Oaks were like second best. And then the only thing that really happened is the script was flipped, right? And somewhere, somehow, both with AP and Nautilus, you know, it was that notion that, wait a minute, these watches are pretty damn iconic, right? And it was sort of like a, a flex, like say, hey, I have on a steel watch and it's 50 or 100 grand, right? And with Vacheron, before 08, post 08, not much has changed. Vacheron, since I started in the business, was a brand that I could call a slew of authorized dealers and pick it up at 10 over cost. So if it was a 45 offline, I would pick, I would buy it for 39 and a half off at any given time. It didn't matter if it was an overseas, it didn't matter if it was a traditional, it didn't matter. Then somewhere about five, six years ago, uh, Vacheron noticed the popularity of their overseas line. So what did they do? They cut discount to dealers. So their overseas, I think, they went from cost being 45 off to their cost being 25 off specifically on, on overseas. And then Vacheron did what everybody else did, and they followed in the footsteps of Francois when everybody laughed at him when he said, I'm going to start cutting out dealers and start selling this stuff through the boutiques. And everybody laughed at him saying, hey, they're online for 30 off. Who's going to buy the stuff at retail for you? But slowly but surely, in a few years, the plan worked and everybody started following suit. I feel like Vacheron was a little late to the party with that, yeah. where they started doing the same thing, going the boutique route and so on and so forth. And that's why really up until a couple of years ago when this whole craze started when we just finally started seeing the overseas line sell over list it has never sold over list and again is it a shame absolutely wonderful watches especially the sports line but if we're talking about market and we're talking about uh the the holy trinity what we need to mention is the top models right yeah. every other model that sort of kind of came up alongside the nautilus the royal oak and the Vacheron overseas were either models that some clients were now forced to buy or models that some guys just saw value in. And that was probably the latter because guys saw a lot of value in the fact, oh, wait a minute, a world time Vacheron Constant Traditionnel with the, color, the colorful dial, it's like you can pick this up for 30 or I'm going to pay 45 for a stainless steel overseas. This is madness. Yeah. Right? I think also VC is, is a pretty unique, uh, like in terms of a case study, because Yes, you saw the rise of the overseas, obviously because sports watches kind of took over the watch world and people who got priced out of a Royal Oak and Nautilus and Aquanaut ended up saying, oh, look, this is a great third option or fourth option uh, in the overseas. But I think one thing specifically that positions VC in a very unique way, uh, contrary to Patek and AP, in their dress watch line is you see a lot of the buyers, at least in my experience, a lot of the buyers of those VC dress watches are also fans of, for example, Independence or FP Journ, and they have that like that th that collector, that niche that really likes the horology of things, things that are underappreciated. Not just horology, the case making, the dial making. That, that appreciate the finer things of, of watchmaking. But also, when you look at even, for example, how they're positioned on the secondary market, for example, they're really uniquely positioned that they're a holy trinity brand, but they're right in that in-between spot between like Patek pricing and JLC and IWC. They're right there in the middle. And so it's like, when you think about the watch enthusiast, okay, JLC is the watchmaker's watchmaker, but here's VC with the holy trinity you know, kind of stamp on it, you get the quality of, you know, the, the seal of approval, all, all of VC's pieces are finished with a Geneva seal except for the 56, but you get the quality, you get the big name recognition, all for a fraction of the price of somebody like Patek Philippe. And I think that makes them a little bit more unique in the marketplace compared to, say, for example, a Patek Philippe. With that said, you have to consider this. I've, numerous times people have asked me this question and uh, I've asked myself this question. If I'm a brand, if I am Patek Philippe, if I'm Audemars Piguet, do I or do I not want the hype that was going on, let's say, a year ago? <laughs> of course you do. I mean, listen, I I brands are printing cash a year ago. You I, know what I, mean? I, I agree, <laughs> but, you know, all of these brands have been there and seen that happen before where, you know, you have a line that's three years long at your boutique for somebody to pick up something. Obviously, you capitalize on it, but how do they capitalize on it? Outside, obviously, they're not charging over list. Obviously, they're 
in case of AP, there are 55,000 watch a year allocations pretty much sold out every year. Yeah. Uh, did I say allocation? No, I meant production. Uh, is sold out every year. I shouldn't say sold out every year because there's some ladies pieces in there, some jewel pieces and things of that nature, but for the most part, sold out. Yeah. But now, you're, now your boutiques are doing what? Now your boutiques are coming in and say, who are you? What's your purchase history? Blah, blah, blah. Well, I would like to create a relationship. I'm, I'm a private client. I'm not a flipper and legitimately, a legitimate client. What are they doing? They're buying code 1159s. They're buying pieces that are not as desirable. They're buying certain offshores and things of that nature or some super complicated pieces that, you know, won't hold that value. And on the one hand, it's a, I believe it's a double-edged sword. That's my answer. On the one hand, you're in the spotlight. Everybody wants an Audemars. So and every rap song, every, every, it's, it's, it's everywhere on every celebrity's wrist. Everybody wants an Audemars Piguet. I mean, it's my favorite brand. I shouldn't, you know. But at the same token, you're now taking models or lines that are, you know, of less of value in terms of popularity, and now you're technically shoving them down people's throats but without, very without smart making them appreciate it. But they're very smart about it. They're very calculated also. You think about the way that they're going about it, right? So they, they even released, for example, Super Sunrise in, in, in uh, the, what's it called, the Code 1159 case, the new Star Wheel, for example. The, the, the perpetual calendars are amazing, the chronographs. So you see what they're, they're trying to do with the Code 1159. They realize, okay, we can use the success of the Royal Oak, sell a Code 1159, but we're not just gonna make a regular Code 1159. We want to attract that kind of consumer base that gains us the respect for horology, right? So you have a kind of, like, if you want, like a multifaceted approach in, okay, you get the hype collectors with the Royal Oak, but then you also get the kind of niche collectors, the, the really the respect from, if you will, the, the, the watch community, watch collector that really loves and appreciates horology through the code 1159. See, when I started in, uh, earlier on, an AP became a big favorite of mine very early on in my career. And, you know, back then, if you look at Audemars Piguet, you had Jules Audemars, Edward Piguet, Royal Oak. And Royal Oak was really a line. It was a Royal Oak and a Royal Oak officer. It was all the same. Uh, they, you had uh, so, so Edward Piguet, Jules Audemars, Millinery, uh, one, two, three, four, Royal Oak, Royal Oak Offshore. You had the five lines. Today, if you look at Audemars Piguet, there's no more Jules Audemars. There's no more Edward Piguet. Yeah. There's no more Millinery. It's just Royal Oak. And the Code 1159, which is basically a Royal Oak sandwich in a case. Right? Yeah. And, and you even, like, again, going back to my point, you see that they're trying to attack, uh, attract that demographic. I mean, you look at what they've been releasing. For example, the new Code 1159 uh, flying turb with the Onyx style, the new Code 1159 with the, the chronograph tourbillon that's skeletonized also. They're, they understand what they're doing with that line, I think, now more so than ever before. Because when you saw the original codes, I mean, it, you saw it just in the, the way the, that it was the received. Issue, the issue in the secondary is the following, is that the minute your top guys fall, your bottom guys tend to go up alongside with the top guys, yep. right? You know, you, the general is in the front and, and the troops are following suit. With that said, the minute the general has a hard fall, the fall on the troops is even harder. Yeah. And that's, and that's really what it comes down to. I feel like Vacheron is going to be the least, out of the three, if you're talking about the markets adjusting, it's no, it's no, jo it's no uh, secret that uh, I just unboxed the, uh, the perpetual that you saw in the chats that I said I bought. Uh, you know, it's a watch that dropped. 50% in price. It I mean, dropped, it's it huge. It it's huge, right? Yeah, it's a huge uh, drop. If you look at if you look at the effect of that drop, I think the most effective brand by that, and I hate to say this, is my favorite brand, Audemars Piguet. Because if you look at Vacheron, if you look at Paddock, even if the Nautilus and Aquanaut lines went from trading at 3x, 4x down to 1.5 to 2x, right? Think about the percentage, how small that is in terms of the percentage of the entire brand. Vacheron, same thing. The overseas yeah. is a tiny little percentage yeah. as far as, because Vacheron has so many different lines, so many different watches, and so does Patek Philippe. Audemars, I think, is the, has the biggest, is facing the biggest issue outside of the fact that they a man have a who, more who might consider a genius Francois is leaving. Yeah. You're now basically saying that 70% of my production has just, you know, took a fall. Yeah. It's it's, it's a lot it's a lot of risk because what you're doing is you're, I mean your entire strategy for years eggs in on one it basket right was yeah, exactly it's all eggs in one basket and now that the basket is kind of it's not not very the, solid. the bottom is falling out yeah you the mean? bottom is falling yeah it's not not so great a look but again that doesn't take anything away from the pedigree of Audemars Piguet which I think is is very underrated in modern in modern times especially because they use that incredible silhouette in the Royal Oak. 
And again, with Patek Philippe, I echo what you would say, right? Even though we saw a drop in price of the Nautilus and the, uh, and the Aquanaut, you didn't really see that, you know, in your 5270s, your 5970s, uh, your minute repeaters, certainly, you know, your world times pretty much stayed even keel, your perpetual calendars likewise. That's the difference. They actually went up and stayed up. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. pretty much, actually, because those are the... They, they, We're selling more annual calendar paddocks going backwards, 5036, 5136, yeah. 5146. We're selling 5040s and 5140s. We're selling more of those than we've ever did because people are waking up. And I think the wake up is in... Nine months ago, it was FOMO. It was hurry up and buy now because there's 20 guys, other guys behind you wanting to buy the same watch. Buy now because today's price is not yesterday's price, right? We, you had that market that was going crazy, going up and up and up and up, and people, you know, they were afraid to miss out. I need to buy it. I need to make a decision right now. But right now we're in the market where people are like, wait a minute. I can actually take a breath, take my time, actually see what the hell I'm buying, actually shop and compare. Like all the things I've always talked about, uh, a lot of my Q&As when people are asking me, put together a collection, what do you think I should buy for this, and what should I look for, and so on and so forth. Now they can look at things like history, complications, finishes, case making, you know, every, everything that makes a single watch great, everything that, that's great that goes into a single watch. And that's why we're selling things like brigades, complicated brigades, or semi-complicated brigades, right? That's why we're selling a lot of the dresser Vacherons, the, let's, uh, the triple calendar, with the step yeah, case, 1942, right? The 1942. The, 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 a dozen of those over the last six months, right? It's people are starting to finally wake up. Now, that doesn't mean they still don't want to buy the Royal Oaks. We're still selling a ton of Royal Oaks, yeah. a ton of Nautilus, a ton of Aquanet at the new price level because there are plenty of people out there where the market priced them watches. out. And now yeah. they, they're priced back in. Yeah. And, that, and, you know, and now that they're, they're priced back in, don't think that you know, the Nautilus is going to become not the most popular model from Paddock. It's going to be a long time till that happens. I think it's going to continue doing this. Same goes for the Royal Oak, and I think same goes for the overseas. But to give you an update on the market, overseas, any, any of the precious metal overseas, they're hovering around that retail price. Yeah. Uh, the steel stuff is still over retail, but not you know, double or, or two and a half times. Yeah. Royal Oaks, uh, a lot of the complicated pieces that, remember, there were quite a few retail price increases as well. So uh, I was unboxing to go back to that Royal Oak uh, Perpetual that I bought. You know, I said, look, these watches you can pick up for around 100000 The current Audemars Royal Oak Perpetual Blue Dial, the retail is one hundred three. By the time you walk out the door, you're paying about one twelve, one fifteen, dollars uh, And... Now, wait a minute, all of a sudden, I don't have to pay 170000 I can go back, pick up a pre-owned piece yep. around that retail price range, which is great. The older stuff, however, the skeletons, the limited editions, the 40th anniversary, 25th, all that stuff is still through the roof because you have auctions that support that. Well, auctions, there's also a small, like, it, it, there's much smaller production. Of course. They, they weren't making 50,000 watches. I mean, at the, like at the time, today. we had uh, the, what, the 25th anniversary tourbillon that we have. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think at that time, we're going back 25 years, I'd be surprised if AP's production was more than 10,000 watches. Yeah, so, so it's a huge, huge difference. I, I, again, I echo pretty much everything that you would say. It's a correction in the market, no doubt, but I think the, the thing that differentiates kind of the other brands from AP is, okay, AP is very reliant on the Royal Oak, but you still see sky-high prices. I mean, we did this analysis with Adrian. You go back six years. I mean, a 15202 six years ago, we sold one for $20,000. You will not find a, a, a good condition, recently dated 15202 for under 70,000. You know what I mean? Like that, that, we're going back six years here. You know, that's not that far. Like this is, I, I, this I wanna, is the I thing. Like, when you topic. actually put that into perspective, it's, it's, it's not that, yeah, it's this, not that this deep near of a dear correction. To your heart. I went, uh, uh, Chris went on uh, live on his channel yesterday along with another Chris. I forget his YouTube channel name. Um, Chris. Watch Chris. Watch Chris. Watch Chris. Yeah. Chris yeah. yeah, watch Chris. And one of the top, we, came, we went on a topic of obviously market, that's the hot topic now, you know, what, what drop, what's, what's stabilized and so on and so forth. And I started talking about the 50th anniversary. And I'm gonna, I went out on a limb and I'll, I will go out on a limb here and say the same thing. I think the 50th anniversary Royal Oaks were the most slept on watches of 2022. They're here, they're gone. Yeah, they're gone. There's huh? no more. There's no more. I spoke to a couple of my friends that have allocations from AP and they said, oh, well, you can get this or you can get that. And there's no more 50th anniversary. And people slept on us so hard because AP made one mistake. They literally reduced them and put them all out on the market at the same time as if they, as if they foresaw this crash or whatever. Maybe it's because Francois was leaving. I don't know. 
But guess what? The market ate them all up. Yeah. And now there's no more. Yeah, go try finding sourcing one. If I, I foresee, for, I foresee for over the next year. Uh, now, when they first came out, some asshole put one up on Chrono for $450,000 to steal Greenberg. I'm just, what are you doing? Right? And, you know, they, they, they came out, they came out high. People were asking over $200,000 for the Chronos, uh, over $300,000 for the 16202, and then the Turbion and the Skeleton, and that yeah, was just it's taking, whatever. It's you, a, whatever. You name your price. It's name your price thing. kind of thing, right? And then they all kind of took a dip. They took a dip before kind of this correction happened because the prices were just a little too high out of the gate. And because so many started showing up, and you had so many guys out there that got them for the purpose of flipping them, i.e. private clients, that prices kind of came down because of that at first, and then the correction happened, and then they follow suit of everybody else. But I still say they were the most slept on because think about going backwards, right? Like um, the we had the well, we had the twenty for the twenty fifth anniversary. We had this. We had three platinum pieces. We had the the platinum blue dial. We had the platinum skeleton, and then we had. Platinum turb, no? The platinum, the platinum turb. No, it was, it was a platinum skeleton turb yeah. that they made, and we had a platinum regular turb, and then the other one was just a platinum skeleton. It wasn't a 25th anniversary. And, you know, those watches uh, sold for, if I had to go back to the original retails, you know, if you look at auction results and what we sold, they sold for probably 7X of their original price. And this is going to be, Audemars not going anywhere. Yeah. You know, uh, 30 years from now, or 25 years for their 75th anniversaries, those 50th anniversary pieces are going to be just as desirable, and they're going to be also trading at 10x their retail value. Mm -hmm. So that, those, those was definitely slept on. I think when it comes to um, Vacheron, I think that the most slept on models, and they are still until today, is the Skeleton Perpetuals. I think the skeleton overseas perpetuals where, yeah, they were trading for some crazy money, and the minute they, they took a dip, they're still out there available, you know, slightly over list, around list. I think these are being slept on as well. I think it's just one of the most beautiful watches in the world. Yeah, no, no doubt. Uh, listen, when it comes to VC specifically, the market has, listen, uh, the overseas, it, it's really segregated to the overseas because the, when you look at their dress watch line, you just can't get that great of deals. I mean, you look at one of my favorite watches at Corn de Bosch. I mean, they're still trading 40,000 where they were 25, not, not that long ago, three, four, four years ago, right? 25, 30,000. We're talking manual and corn grass. You know, what kind of price appreciation do you see for, for things like that? Those are much nicher watches. So uh, it's really segregated uh, in terms of the overseas. And, and I tend to agree with you. The overseas complication line, specifically the new skeleton tourbillons, the new skeleton, I mean, first of all, go find a skeleton tourbillon. You cannot find one. You can. go, go find a skeleton uh, perpetual. You can, amazing value right now. So yeah, I think the overseas line has become extremely slept on if you consider where it was trading at versus where it is now. Uh, there's, just, there's just absolutely no doubt. Yeah. The minute there is a hint of an uptick in the market. Things happen extremely fast in the watch industry, and I'm speaking from experience that, again, to go back to 2008. I hear as, you've been doing this 20 years. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> as long as, long as, as, long as uh, the minute that there is a, again, 2008 is not a fair comparison because 2008 was a crash, right? Yeah. You know, obviously economically right now we're in a, what I like to call a funny recession. I don't want to say I'm in denial. I understand all the economical factors, and you out of all people understand this the most. Uh, all the economic factors obviously point to a recession, a yeah. normal recession, cyclical economies, right? It happens every so often. And, but yet there's certainly, there's a lot of funny things that are going on in the world today where you see certain markets up, uh, you know, at this point I would think gold would be over 3,000 an ounce, but it's not, right? In fact, it just keeps fluctuating around the same price going down, going up a little bit. You have crypto, which was a big unknown, right? That's still, yeah, maybe a tiny effect, but I think it was more of a, mental effect because all of crypto's market cap doesn't nearly make up a, a big percentage of anything but mentally and because they're showing your face you know it's sort of more of a mental it, it's a falling knife right yeah, nobody yeah. wants to catch a exactly. falling knife yeah uh then so if you look at this and you look at the situation now post 2008 uh when the, within nine months time the luxury market recovered two price levels before 08 crisis and beyond uh, this was diamonds were the fastest. I think diamonds recovered within six months' time, like especially some of the bigger stuff, ten carats and up, like investment grade type of diamonds. Same came, same happened with watches, and you know the hottest items back in the market back then from Paddock were your fifty nine seventies, right? Yeah. And if you look at a fifty nine seventy today in good condition, especially if you're looking at some of the rarer metals like platinum, 
they're trading through the roof. They're still two and a half x their original retail price. Right? You look at the uh, Audemars Piguet. Back then, it was the limited edition offshores that went through the roof. The biggest gainer back then was a Platinum Grand Prix. It was trading at $125,000. But if you look at some of the models that were more down to earth, like the Juan Pablo Montoya, still damn near 2X. T3, still damn near 2X. So the, the, the models that were hot back then, they're still trading at a pretty significant value, and they're still relevant. That's the most important yeah. part. So the minute you're going to see a little bit of an uptick in the market, and the reason I'm, I am optimistic about it, honestly, we printed a fuck ton of money. Yeah. No There's a still a fuck ton of money out there. Yeah. Right? And people are looking at what? The JP Morgans, the Bloombergs, the Wall Street Journals that are all of a sudden writing all these indexes. All of a sudden, yeah. our, our market became an index. 20 years, I've been screaming, watch this is not an investment, enjoy them for what they are. But it's an index. Yeah, no, no doubt. It's become a traded economy. I mean, watches have become a commoditized item, a commoditized good, and they certainly are traded in the same way that other other things are. You look at the luxury watch market. I mean, you see some projections going, you know, from now into 20, 2033, upwards of eighty billion dollars. I mean, we're at thirty right now. You know, if they're making that kind of price predictions, they're not just pulling those. You know, th- yeah, those are people that kind of know. What yeah, exactly. don't take it from us. They're, they're not. They're not pulling those, those kind of numbers. You know, from from nowhere. They're, they're informed perspectives because they understand that the watch market is just okay it came up a lot in the last couple of years but you think about how niche of an industry it was even just you going back five years again it was extremely niche and now when you factor in the idea that watches are now this alternative asset in the same way art is or cars or you know luxury vehicles handbags jewelry diamonds all this other stuff I mean, it's a total game changer. It's a complete game changer for the watch industry. So, listen, I think I'm right there with you. I think the market is very bright in terms and the of the minute, future. And the minute, uh, and it starts, again, just like the price correction started on, in our market, the secondary market, B2B market, right? Because the retail consumer didn't really start feeling the correction up until way, very late into the summer, where the B2B business, which we do a lot of still, uh, you know, we started feeling that towards uh, beginning of the summer, end of May, beginning of the summer, right? And the uptick is going to be felt first again on the B2B end. So when guys like us start to see that uptick and start feeling that uptick among each other, you guys have no idea how many billions of dollars are being traded on a daily basis just on <laughs> Chats, yeah. five million WhatsApp groups that are <laughs> out there, each WhatsApp group holding 500 dealers, right? Uh, it's we see that uptick right away. And then what happens, those that have survived, those that have been around for a while, those that have the money, really, the minute they see that uptick, what do we start doing? We start buying that stuff up. That in yeah. turn then translates onto the retail market. And I think the difference between 08 and the recovery of this market is going to be that we're going to go back to the usual suspects. In 2008, we didn't go back to the usual suspects. 5960 Platinum, right? annual calendar chronograph, you know, pretty iconic watch in my mind. It was a watch that was trading, and at the time the retail was 52,000. It was trading at 85 grand, you know, it was like, oh my God, that was like the watch to have. That's a watch that never recovered. 5970s, it took them a good 10 years until they started recovering because, you know, the 5270 was introduced, it's become older, much like the 3970s, right? Yeah. Uh, so a lot of the hot stuff, from those days didn't recover because contrary to all belief, before 08, the hot models were not the Nautiluses. They were, they were the, the soldiers where it was the complicated, the grand complication line that was the hot soldiers, right? It was your 5970s, it was all the minute repeaters, all the turbions. Those were the, those were the generals and it was the Nautiluses and Aquinas that started coming behind, up behind them. I think this time around, once we see that turnaround, I think you are going to go back to, all these, to, to the same exact thing what it was. It's going to be the Nautiluses, the Aquanauts, the Royal Oaks, the Overseas. Because I don't see, as of right now, an alternative within those three brands, the Holy Trinity specifically, that uh, you know, could sort of put a Nautilus on a back burner, put an Overseas on a back burner, and be like, oh, I'm the next new thing. Yeah. But it's also in terms of visibility, right? When, when you're, you're shown a watch you know, on social media repetitively, constantly. When you look on social media, I'm sorry, I'm not seeing that many 5970s. I am seeing 5740s. You yeah. know what I mean? So, so that's the difference, right? I'm seeing a perpetual calendar Nautilus. I'm not seeing a perpetual calendar chronograph. Why? Because Patek you're, so, vic- you're yeah. victim of the clicks, right? Of course. It, you, you know, how many times, if I scroll down, sometimes I don't have anything better to do, and I'll scroll down to my feed, like going back two, three years, 
And I'm looking at the light, you know, I, I put on a beautiful Jaeger Perpetual or, or, or a Ulysses Nardine or something like that. Yeah. And then the minute I put up a watch, it's like 10 it's, 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 like it's like 10 a thousand. Yeah, it's, like, so, it's not even comparable. But if, you, if you're someone whose business is social media, and there's a lot of people out there like that, yeah. vloggers, bloggers, uh, you call them whatever you want, influencers, right, that yeah. have the big accounts. You see celebrities wearing those watches, they're you're not going to You're yeah. not going to post a watch that's not going to get the engagement if you have one watch that's going to get more engagement than the next one, that's the watch. Those are the type of watches you're going to continue posting, and that's what gets into people's heads. Yeah, no doubt, social media has been a game changer. Now, I want to kind of switch gears. We've talked history, we've talked horology, we've talked even the market. I want to know what's what's the future outlook. What do you think, or what do you want to see from brands? I look at a brand like Patek Philippe. I look at VC. I look at AP. What I'm seeing now is that their game has to be raised. You see the rise of independent watchmaking. People are putting a greater focus in terms of what goes into a watch and, and how it's made. Are you seeing that also, and do you like this, or what do you want to see in the future from these brands? Well, for one, you know, we agree all three brands have the watchmaking. They have the horological capabilities, if whatever you want to call it. No doubt. They can flex their muscles. Yeah. I think it's them highlighting it more. And I think the easiest way to highlight something like that is to take an existing popular model and complicate it. Think about what, and again, AP is the leader on this. Uh, I think Vacheron as well. Paddock, maybe not so much. I want to see a Nautilus minute repeater. I want to see a Nautilus Turbion. I want to Which see, we've never seen, by the way. Which, the only grand complication has been the 5740 perpetual exactly, calendar. Yeah. Exactly. And even, I, I, you know, Paddock uses the word grand complication, you know. Yeah, a perpetual. For their, for their, for Anything perpetual, with more than four complications. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Four complications, yeah. So, uh, Paddock has already wowed us. Let's talk Paddock. Paddock has already wowed us with their Grandmaster Chimes with their Skymoon Turbions, with just the sky chart, uh, the 6102, the 5102, right? A slew of perpetual annual calendars. We know they have that pedigree. In order for them to wow us again and to put focus on horology and complications and show, really showing people how big their dick is, they only can do it within the models such as the Nautilus, such as the Aquanaut, right? Yeah. They're hottest models. And it's also in terms of visibility, right? And, visi do and visibility. Yeah, doing that will give you visibility, S unseen visibility. Skeleton. Yeah. Uh, I think one of the most underrated watches from Patek Philippe is their most recent skeleton, which was the 5180 on a bracelet, yeah. especially that mesh bracelet. I actually love that bracelet. Most people hate it. Uh, watch was slept on big time. You know, first came out the usual, a little bit higher, then came back down to earth, like any other new model that comes out from Patek ever, basically. Uh, now imagine a skeleton Nautilus, just a comparable yeah. well, comparable to the skeleton. If somebody Royale. does do it, it's Artisan de Genie, right? right? And they actually do it very successfully. People I'm like still it. Surprised it's a that good I'm looking still, watch. I'm, I'm still surprised they haven't been sued up and down by Rolex and, and Paddock. <laughs> yeah, no I, I don't doubt. understand yeah. how they're still around. But if you're Paddock, if you want to, if you if your goal is to highlight, hey, this is how big our dick is horologically you take that and you put it into a Nautilus case. Not even Aquanaut, Nautilus. Yeah, Nautilus. Specifically it's Nautilus. The king, Very the successful the sports, with the yeah. 5740 perpetual calendar. Vacheron has actually already done that. Vash, the skeleton turbion from uh, overseas, the perpetual skeleton overseas, just a regular perpetual overseas. Yeah, they've done perpetual they, chronos. They, 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 they perpetual chronos. So all those things they have already done. So I don't think there's much for them to do. Other than maybe... Again, I, I don't. It's tough for me to advise because Vashon was sort of like, it's, it's more so, or less. So yeah. So the, for me, Vashon. It's such a variety. At, it's very hard. Yeah. So to me, the the line that shines the most from VC is the Historiques collection, right? The, the reimagining. I, I, you know, I was a bit disappointed. I'm not going to lie to you with the VC two two two. I've been on record saying this. It's not my favorite watch because you look at the Historiques line. What they do is they take old designs and modernize them. Nineteen twenty ones, I like. Correct. I love the nineteen twenty one. But what they did with that watch, they took the original design, modernized the case, modernized the look of it. What they did with the two two two, they took the watch from the seventies and just redid the watch in two thousand and twenty two. You know what I mean? So I, I think if that reimagine that in a slightly bigger case and skeletonized. Uh, yeah, I think there's so much can be that, that can be done if a VC goes back into their archives. They also have a lot of... But they're, lot also, they're also the only brand, because I can't think of another brand that was as successful remaking their old stuff. Yeah, Jaeger no. had a little bit of success. Nobody uh, else. What is it? Uh, I mean, the only... The AP's... Uh, 
what was it? That was a flop. Uh, the recent uh, remake that they made. Uh, oh, the remaster. The, rema the remaster zero one. Yeah, that was yeah, a flop. Yeah. I love the watch. It's beautiful. But it yeah. was a flop. Yeah, right. It's a beautiful flop. watch. It's, it's a thirty thousand dollar watch at this point. You exactly. Know I mean? yeah. So it's like you know. So Vacheron has been successful with that, but I, I think you're right. I think they dropped the ball on a two two two. So I personally, when it comes to advice to Vacheron, I think you stay even key. Maybe cut production a little bit. Continue yep. with the same model of boutique only. Uh, you know, application pieces and things like that. Uh, when it cut production in terms of models, they have way too many models. They're making like no, too, no, that's the thing. too many. I think of the that's same what I think that's what watches. AP is lacking. No, that's what AP is doing is is lacking. But I'm saying VC makes too many of the same looking watches. They got to cut down their model line, trim some stuff, and then expand their histories collection because I think that's where they really shine in terms of design and also pedigree. And they just make good. You're saying stuff. they don't have designers that can do a better job today than the guys did back in the 1920s. <laughs> I, listen. I, it doesn't, it, it's a kudos to the guys who used to design watches in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s for them because they just look really good. I will, and I'm, and I'm going to finish this all with my favorite brand, AP. You know, if I, if I were to, what I would like to see in the future from them is cutting down, really cutting down, yeah. really cutting down. 40 to 50,000 is not a good idea. 40 to 50,000, I think, is too much at this point. Yeah. I would certainly, I would cut down the Royal Oak line, cut it down. In terms of models, like you said, for VC, which I didn't really agree with, but for 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 Audemars Piguet, cutting down their Royal Oak model to just go back to the basics, one Carano, one Perpetual, one uh, Plain Jane. That's it. Just leave it at that. Maybe sometime, whoever the new CEO is going to be. By the way, guys, I'm available. <laughs> Call me. I almost wish I could have 30 minutes in a room with him because. I would absolutely give them free advice based on my experience and based on the love for the brand because I think that if they just took on that particular model, everybody bites off of each other in the watch industry in terms of design, complications, marketing, you name it, right? But then kind of the same in many other industries, not just the watch industry. But it, by cutting down production or at least releasing it out in steps, right, where a, this is the year that I'm putting out the 17202, which would be the next radiation, I guess, because we're at 16202, or I'm putting out the 15600 this year, but I'm putting it out in a precious metal. Yeah. Next year, you're going to see a steel version. For a collector, for a private client, how desirable is that when you know that, A, this year, this is the watch. I got this. Comes next year, two years from now, oh my God, they made this in steel. Because when... A collector comes to you. How many how many clients have you ever had call you say, okay, I want the fifteen five hundred. I want it in rose gold. I want it in yellow gold. I want it in steel with a blue, black, and white dial at the same time. It doesn't happen. Yeah, and that's what I think. That would be probably my number one advice to them. And then continue taking shots. Continue taking shots with new lines because yeah, try. Really you know, yeah, try. bring back the Edward Piguet in a more modernized way. You know, bring back that probably worst seller ever, millinery. Never really had much. Yeah, I think with the it. code line has kind of taken over the millinery line yeah, in terms of purpose. Or jewels, or yeah. you, you, even the jewels. I think yeah. as well. The code is kind of the new, new exactly. kind of modernized version of that. So yeah. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna wrap this up with, I guess, one simple conclusion is that there is no conclusion. Right now, we're in a market that has stabilized, uh, plus minus 15, 20 percent, as I like to say. You know, which to me is a normal market. Uh, none of us know what the future holds. But nevertheless, I know that you know there's still a huge future in this industry for starting with the big boy companies, going through to the independents and down to gray market dealers such as ourselves. It's gonna be a fun year, 2023. I can't wait to see how all the companies are going to shift and adjust, starting with the Holy Trinity three brands along with everybody else that's under there. It's gonna be a fun year to watch, but one thing is for certain, me, Marco, and the rest of the LB crew are going to be here to keep you updated and keep you posted and tell you as we see it. Yeah. So, guys, I appreciate you tuning in, and uh, we'll see you on the next one.